a senator. It's a little piece of sort of palace intrigue which gives you an idea of how desperately Andres Manuel wants to control power in Mexico. In the, uh, in the Senate, um, he, uh, as, uh, as Jeremy said, he's very close to getting the, uh, uh, the supermajority. The four who crossed the floor, sorry, I didn't make this clear, were in the Chamber of Deputies. Um, but uh, it wouldn't be difficult for Andres Manuel to get the extra votes that he needs in order to get a two-thirds majority. If he has the two-thirds majority in both chambers of Congress, then the path is relatively clear for constitutional change because in the July election, he also won 19 out of 32 state legislatures. And that uh, majority of state legislatures is the one piece that would be missing if you wanted to change the Constitution. So if Andrew Manuel wants to change the Constitution, he can just go ahead and do it. There's nothing stopping him, really, at this point in time. So the question is, does he want to change the Constitution? Throughout the election campaign, he expressed uh, a preference for not changing the Constitution in the first half of his mandate. He said that he would not do it in the first three years. Um, since then, he suggested that one of his priorities is to unmake the education reform of 2013, which would require a constitutional change. So I don't think he's going to stick to that. But he has suggested that the energy reform, which he understands is so important to investors, will remain untouched at the constitutional level. However, he has also said, and he said this repeatedly during the election campaign, that the secondary legislation or the implementing legislation will be changed. So his priorities there on the energy uh, front, I think we will come back and we'll talk about that in greater detail. But I think that we see uh, that the concentration of power that he's managed to attain in Congress is only one of the dimensions. The second dimension is at the level of the states. I've talked about the state legislatures. But one of the first things that Andrés Manuel did was he met with all 32 of Mexico's governors. And he had a very nice photo opportunity. They're all standing there smiling, everyone shaking hands, congratulating the president-elect. But then he proceeded to meet with each of them individually. As he traveled around the country, he got each of the governors to come and meet with him. And again, lovely photo opportunities. But behind the scenes, the message was clear. There's a new boss in town, and he's not the same as the old boss. And what do I mean by that? Well, part of Andres Manuel's diagnosis of the problem of Mexico is that Mexico has become ungovernable. That through democratization, a competitive party system, and through devolution of power to the states, in particular devolution of financial power, the governors have become far too independent, and they do essentially what they want. And he believes, Andrew Manuel believes, that one of the critical components in reestablishing governance in Mexico is to take back control from the governors. And the way in which he's done this is not just through these little bilateral meetings with the, uh, uh, with the governors, but he has announced his plan to send a superdelegado, a superdelegate, or a virrey, a viceroy, to each of the states. And that viceroy will essentially control how the governor spends his or her federal appropriation. If you want a perfect form of the power of the purse, you have it right there. In other words, the governors will have to consult with Andres Manuel's representative in each state before they spend the money that's given to them by the federal government. It's kind of a beautiful and direct way of reestablishing control. The third element of the centralization of power that we see in Mexico, is Andrés Manuel has launched essentially an attack on the Mexican public service. He's announced that there will be widespread cutbacks in terms of positions, particularly at the highest levels. He's announced that there will be salary cuts for uh, most public servants. So Andrés Manuel has agreed to take a presidential salary of around $5,000 a month, which is half of what uh, uh, Enrique Peña Nieto was making. And in Mexico, no public servant can make more than the president. So all of those Mexican public servants who were making $120,000 a year before are now going to be making $60,000 a year. In addition, he's cutting their benefits. He's taking away private health insurance, their cell phones, their drivers, and various other nice little uh, benefits that they had before. In addition to that, he's announced that he's going to be moving certain government agencies out of Mexico City to the provinces or to the states. In particular, energy will be moved from Mexico City to the state of Tabasco, Andres Manuel's own state, and of course what he sees as being the center of the energy sector. Um, Migración, for example, the INM, the Instituto Nacional de Migración, will be moved from Mexico City to Tijuana, because Tijuana is where migration happens, right? Now imagine that you are a public servant, 
you work in the energy ministry, and your spouse works in the Migration Institute. Your future is you're going to be living at other ends of the, uh, of the country. Now, for some couples, that may be a dream solution to many problems. <laughs> Saves a hell of a lot of money on lawyers, if you ask me. But imagine that you have children who are in school. Imagine that uh, you have uh, you know, obligations and the rest of your family in Mexico City. This is going to be a very tricky situation. Now, add on top of that that you're cutting salaries, you're taking away private health insurance. A lot of the best public servants in Mexico are already planning their escape if they haven't left the public service already. We saw a mass exodus during this summer of some of the top public servants in Mexico. They want to take early retirement, if it's at all possible, because they'll retire at their higher salary level. We're going to see even more leaving over the next few months. Now, you may be thinking, why would a president who wants to establish control over the country reduce his execution capacity by getting rid of all of these excellent public servants? Well, there are two reasons. The first one is that Andrés Manuel has a diagnosis of the Mexico's public service that it's too full of technocrats, the kind of people who have been running and ruining the country for the last 30 years. He sees that if they were to stay in their current positions, this would act as a form of deep state, as we would call it here in the United States. So he wants to get rid of them. But he has a second part to the plan, which is that he intends to replace them with loyalists. One of the early announcements from his Morena party after the election was that it would be creating a sort of university for public servants, which is essentially a center for indoctrination of new Morena politicians and public servants. Within a couple of years, those people will be placed back into the Mexican public service, which means that not only will Andres Manuel have a public service that works with him, not against him, but long after he's left office, those same public servants will still be in their positions. This is truly a grand plan for centralizing power in the hands of the president. And that's, as I, as I said earlier on, that's what he sees is the solution to the ungovernability of Mexico. Andres Manuel has also, as Jeremy suggested earlier on, he's also turned to the plebiscite, something which fills most political scientists with horror and any observer of Latin America with great um, foreboding. Twice uh, during the transition period, there has been a consulta publica. The first one was on the uh, airport project in Mexico City, a $13 billion airport project, which was abandoned or has now been abandoned by, uh, by the new government because the people who voted, and there was around 1 million people who voted out of an electoral roll of close to 100 million, um, of that, uh, that the 1 million people, 70% said that they the new airport project should be abandoned in favor of what Andres Manuel would like to do with the airport in Mexico City. Just to give you a point of comparison, in all of the public opinion polls that were taken about the airport project leading up to and immediately after that plebiscite, 70% of people said that the airport project should continue. So something was a little bit funky. A million votes were cast, but only 500,000 ballots were printed up. How did he get the rest of the votes? Well, he set up tables in town squares in certain strategic parts of the country. This is how Andres Manuel believes that democracy should work in the New Mexico. In the second consulta publica or plebiscite, 10 issues were put on the ballot. This time, less than a million people voted, and 86% of the voters approved of the projects that Andres Manuel had put forward, 86%. I mean, these are Chavez Maduro-like numbers that we're seeing. Both of these referenda were non-binding. They didn't conform to any of the rules of the Mexican Electoral Institute. They didn't conform to any of the rules of the Constitution about when you can have a consulta pública. In the aftermath of that, when the private sector in Mexico was kicking and screaming, the head of the House of, uh, of the Chamber of Deputies, Mario Delgado, uh, the Morena leader, went on national television, and he said to the leader of one of the business uh, chambers, um, Coparmex, he said, do you not like the consulta publica? You'd better get used to it, because we're putting in place legislation to make it much easier for us to use the consulta publica for any issue that we want. This is going to be a permanent feature of the Andres Manuel government. Now, that consultation with the public serves two purposes for Andres Manuel. First of all, it legitimates the decisions that he's made. And just to give you an idea, one of the issues on the, 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 the recent consulta publica, which took place last weekend, was about building a train link across the Yucatan Peninsula, something called the Tren Maya. 
And Anders Manuel, in the days leading up to the consulta publica, says, yes, we're going to have a, a plebiscite on this over the weekend, and work is going to start on it next month. So he already knew what the result was going to be, clearly. Um, so the first one is legitimation. But the second one is that it seems as though the Mexican public actually really likes this. Even though less than one million people participated, in opinion polls, Mexicans say, we actually like the fact that he's listening to us. Our leaders have never listened to us in the past. They've never asked us what we thought. And in fact, after the first plebiscite, his approval rating went up by 10%. Now, we'll see if those numbers hold. Because the other thing that's been going on in Mexico is that because of the uncertainty caused by these plebiscites, because of the uncertainty called by certain decisions in the energy sector, we're seeing that there has been a flight of, uh, of capital from Mexico. There's been attack on the Mexican peso. The Mexican stock exchange is at its lowest point in four years. So to give you some of the numbers, back in July, the Mexican stock index, the IPC, was at 50,000. It's currently at around 39,000, so it's lost 20% of its value. The Mexican peso was around 18.39. It touched, the other day, two days ago, it touched 21 to the peso, sorry, to the dollar. Uh, foreign direct investment in Mexico was down 74% in the third quarter. International investors are showing that they are not happy about the incoming administration. Does Andres Manuel care about that? He cares in the sense that he doesn't want to see a complete economic meltdown in Mexico because he knows that that would really destroy many of the plans that he has for the country. But does he believe that we should really keep the investors happy ahead of the people? Absolutely not. And a very nice op-ed was published a few weeks ago in Mexico City after the, uh, uh, the airport referendum, which said, we're all sitting here and we're all complaining about the economic costs of these decisions. We're complaining that, you know, apparently he doesn't understand the economic logic at work here. He said, that's not the point. He understands the economic logic, but he doesn't care. His priority is the political logic. It's about power. It's about showing that there's a new boss or a new sheriff in town. It's about saying, I said I was going to do this, and I'm doing it. That's what Andres Manuel is all about. It's about establishing control centralizing power. And with that, I think we'll turn it back to Jeremy to begin the conversation about what specifically is happening in energy. No, perfect. Thank you so much, Duncan. That <clears throat> it, it, it tees up exactly where I wanted to start, and that is with a couple of things I, I think are, are, are so remarkable in terms of the transition period, and that is he's not president, as I noted, for two more days, and yet there have been two public consultations already held in the, in the last couple of months. So you've, you've had decisions purportedly being made for the country before he's even officially taken office. And so I think that's something very interesting. Um, th the popular consult question I want to focus on, but I, let me back up and say, I, I mentioned this at the outset, and the thing I think that's very interesting and I want to talk a little bit about is this, this idea that when Andres Manuel López Obrador talks about energy, he's really talking about oil. It's, it's, it's a synonym. Energy, in many ways, for Andres Manuel López Obrador is oil. It's, it's a synonym for him. It's, it's a 1970s world uh, in certain ways when it comes to oil and Pemex and national identity and energy sovereignty. Um, and so that's extremely important as we start to look at some of the decisions. And you noted, well, where does he want to move his energy ministry and who has he appointed as the energy minister to the oil producing state of Tabasco? Obviously, it's his hometown and there's a whole lot of reasons why he has these these predispositions to, to, to sort of his perceptions of, of oil and energy being synonymous. But let's take the refinery question, because I think this is something I want to I want to ask you about. So the refinery question has been something. And in fact, it's down to one refinery. And, and at one point in time, and as I mentioned, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador had run for president for the better part of 18 years. And during many of those years, one of his key principles or parts of his platform was that Mexico needed as an oil producing nation, there was no reason that they should import as much product, refined product from the oil sector as they did. And so therefore, one of his platform uh, pieces was that Mexico needed to modernize, build new refineries. Four or five refineries at one point was sort of the, on the table that they were talking about. But the idea of removing importation of refined products 
Forget the economics of it. The idea of building a new refinery in Mexico. And, and so now we've seen this move forward. Obviously, it's gone down to now one refinery. All of the economic questions have seemed to be cast aside. Everyone's argued there's no point uh, in 2018, 2019 for building a brand new refinery. There's all kinds of economics that, that, that call it uh, into question. I don't think any of that seems to matter. And now it's actually been put as one of the 10 questions in the most recent consulta. And so my question to you is, it, it, will that refinery be built and how will they do it? Because now we're, they're talking about coming up with the 2.5 million. And again, I don't think it's a matter of economics dissuading or climate change issues dissuading. I mean, this seems to be something that's gonna happen. So how does that move forward from here? So, um to give you a little bit of context, in back in May, and I can't remember whether it was before or after La Jolla, I had the chance to sit down with Rocío Nali, the future energy, energy minister, and I, I, I questioned her about the refinery plans. And I said, uh, you know, this doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. You're saying that you're going to build a new refinery, that it's going to take you three years to build a refinery, and I don't know of many places in the world where that's possible. Um, you say it's going to cost you between four and six billion dollars. My understanding is the refinery of that capacity is going to cost you around nine billion, you know, if you're lucky, not counting in sort of overruns, et cetera. Um, and the third point is, you know, Pemex loses money on every barrel of oil that it, ref that it refines. In fact, what we've seen throughout this administration is that as Mexican refinery output has declined, Pemex's losses have declined. It's an extraordinary thing. In fact, Pemex refining actually turned a profit for the first time earlier on this year, and that's because it is producing a fraction of what it used to produce. So the more you produce, it seems, the more money you lose. Well, Rocio's response was, I don't know why you say it uh, can't be done in three years. I've been to a refinery out in India where it cost them $5 billion, and it, they built it in three years. And my response was, have you seen the Tula refinery project that was launched in 2009? You know, that was supposed to be a $10 billion project that was supposed to take a few years. It's 10 years later, and we have one of the world's most expensive fences around a piece of land. Um, nothing has happened there. She says, well, that's because the other guys are corrupt, okay? And she said, and, and in order to get the money for this, it doesn't matter because what I've, just, what I've learned is that Pemex has, and she used the word in English, holdings, around the world that are worth billions of dollars. We've just identified a Pemex holding in Singapore that's worth $3 billion. And I said, why do you think that no one's used that money before? And she says, I don't know. I guess it's been hidden somewhere so that somebody can have a nice retirement. It's interesting, who knows? Maybe I'm wrong, but I seem to be, I, I, I am rather skeptical about all of that. Um, on the question of the cost of refining, again, it's entirely secondary. It's not about how much each barrel costs. It's about the fact that it's a Mexican barrel. This is energy nationalism, pure and simple. And it ties in entirely, it's entirely consistent with the idea of economic nationalism that uh, Andres Manuel has espoused from the very beginning. Um, now, in terms of the refinery, what have we seen? Well, one interesting thing that we have seen is that during the transition period, uh, Andres Manuel's people have interacted with every level of the Mexican government of the outgoing administration, and in particular with Pemex. And the existing Tula refinery, not the second one they were going to build, the existing Tula refinery has seen its production increase from around 50,000 barrels a day up to 240,000 barrels a day during the summer. That's an extraordinary expan expansion. And the reason for that is they've been told at Pemex, you know, the cost be damned, Let's produce Mexican gasoline. So is, are they serious about building a refinery? Of course they're serious about building a refinery. They're serious about building a refinery in Dos Bocas, Tabasco, because that's the, the site that they've identified. They've got a referendum to back them up that says the people want a refinery. They've got, um, uh, have they got the money to do it? No, but they can get the money. And we're all speculating about where they're going to get the money from. But one of the best theories that I've heard is that the Mexican pension system, which was uh, privatized in part back in 1999, very successfully so, to overcome the problems of the demographic bubble that was pushing its way through, and the state-run pension system just couldn't cope with it. A system called the Afore system, private pension plans were created in Mexico. That has 
many hundreds of billions of dollars in it. The plan, I think, is that they're going to change the regulation of the Afores so that the investment fund managers have to invest a certain percentage of that money into national infrastructure projects and maybe directly into national energy projects. And there's a, lot, a great deal of debate about this in Mexico right now, but I think that's the easiest way for them to get the money. So, uh, refining is going to happen. Mexican refining is going to happen. Will they be able to get the project done in three years, as Rocio Nale claims? Well, as one of a, a friend of mine who works for a major infrastructure company said to me recently, he said, uh, you know, he'd had this conversation with Andres Manuel and with Ro Ro Rocio herself. And uh, Andres Manuel is insistent that you can do this in three years. And when you say, why do you think it can be done in three years? He says, because Rocio told me so. And the answer from the infrastructure company was this. We can do it in three years. It just depends when you start the clock. Do you start the clock now? When you've bought the terreno, the piece of land, when you've got the permisos, the permits, when you've got all the plans, when do you start the clock? Because if you've got everything else sorted out and it's just a question of construction, we could probably build it in three years, absolutely. But that'll be three years from now that we start construction. So by the end of Andres Manuel's administration, we may see a new refinery completed. But in Mexican terms, I think that would be kind of a record as well, because we don't see projects being completed that quickly. Well, and, and that, and the, the interesting thing here is then you get into the question of the, the, the just historical uh, fact that political calendars and energy timelines do not line up. And whether it's a refinery project, whether it's a gas project, even, even significant uh, power generation projects, they tend to be of a nature that are long-term and require a certainty uh, that lasts beyond one government or another. So I want to open this up to, to everyone here, but a couple of, of, of final points just to, to converse about a couple other energy issues um, that ties back to some of your remarks. So I, I made these emphatic statements about oil being the, the, what he really cares about. Um, and with that, I want to have one follow-up point before we ask something about electricity. But the follow-up on that is having to do with regulation. Um, some things that we've seen percolating in the Congress, um, which, by the way, has already taken the, the majorities, his party's already in the Congress that's in session now are the majorities of the Morena party. So this is his Congress already. It, the Congress took office already. I think it's a point to make. So the question here is about the legislation and some of the efforts to your arguments of, 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 of asserting control in, over the regulatory body CRE and the regulatory body CNH, and there's been discussion about trying to move those, which are autonomous regulatory bodies for the energy sector, and to move those under the energy ministry, which is ostensibly the policy-making body, not the regulatory body. And there's a huge importance of distinction there. Um, what's, what's the latest on some of that legislation? And then the, the sort of tangential question to that is, where are we on the contracts, because there's been over 100 oil contracts that have been let and signed by the government of Mexico. There's been some hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of investment that have begun to flow and have been committed as part of those contracts. Um, now, you talked about legislation that was going to perhaps aim at the secondary legislation of energy reform. Does it get into the contracts of, that are underway? So there's a couple different questions there. Regulation, legislation that may overhaul regulation, any legislation that may overhaul the contractual environment for oil and gas? So, I mean, on the regulatory bodies, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. So the legislation was presented in the Mexican Congress to try to bring the Hydrocarbons Commission and the Energy Regulatory Commission under direct control of Senate. Um, so they being the Energy Ministry. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and one of the things that came out immediately was that the folks who had presented this legislation don't really understand the energy sector, and they don't really understand the Constitution, because those autonomous powers are guaranteed in the Constitutional Reform of 2013. So you would have to change the Constitution in order to bring them under the direct control of the Energy Ministry. Um, so that legislation didn't really go anywhere. And it was an interesting piece of political theater. The legislation was presented. There was a very negative reaction uh, from the private sector and from some investors. And then Andres Manuel's team said, no, we're not planning on doing that. So there's, there's mm. one of two or maybe two of two scenarios that are playing out here. One is that you have 
uh, a legislature controlled by the president's party, but the president doesn't really control his party directly. He's allowing them to do whatever the heck they want, come up with brilliant ideas, okay, and seeing hey, if look they at me, actually look work. At me. Exactly. So you've got a competition here. The other one is that the president is actually floating ideas through the Congress and saying, you put it out there and see how people react to it. And then if it doesn't go well, I'll disavow it in public. And it's entirely possible that both of those things are happening at the same time. <laughs> They're not so, mutually exclusive. No, exactly. So I'm not convinced that the attempt to reestablish control over the Hydrocarbons Commission and the Energy Regulatory Commission is, is over and done with. In fact, I'm sure it isn't. And the reason for this is that if we go back uh, about 18 months, had a very, very interesting dinner in Mexico City with some representatives of the, uh, uh, of, uh, from private oil companies and two representatives of the Morena Party on the energy front. And these two gentlemen, over many tequilas, eventually loosened up and they said, look, <laughs> Andres Manuel understands that he probably isn't going to get the majorities he needs in Congress to change the Constitution, because that's what we thought at the time. <laughs> But do you think that's going to stop him from trying to change the energy sector? And went through various different things. And one of the things that they said in that dinner was, with the Energy Regulatory Commission and with the Hyd National Hydrocarbons Commission, he is going to want to have his own commissioners in there as soon as possible. And we said, well, they are there for fixed terms, you know, naively. And he says, yeah, but you don't understand Andres Manuel. Andres Manuel will go to each of them. He'll tap them on the shoulder and say, oye, hijo, listen, son. You were appointed by the previous president. I'm the president now. You shouldn't be here anymore. So what happened recently? The president of the National Hydrocarbons Commission, Juan Carlos Cepeda, announced that he was resigning because he was going to pursue other activities. Now, what's the true story behind that? I don't know, to be honest with you. There is, I spoke to somebody recently who said, in fact, no, you're, you're exaggerating the situation, Duncan. In fact, what's going to happen is that he's going to become a very close advisor to Rocio Nale. I was like, but why wouldn't he do that from his current position? Like, if he's that close to Andres Manuel, and if he's that close to Rocio Nale, why wouldn't he just stay? What's ironic about this is that Andres Manuel will be able to change almost all of the commissioners anyway throughout his six-year term. But again, it's a question of establishing who's boss early on, and that's what he's done. So on that front, I think that uh, you know, we're looking at the reestablishment of direct control over the energy regulatory bodies as soon as possible. And if you speak to folks who are on those commissions, they're deeply, deeply concerned about their own futures. Mm -hmm. And they say, we don't know how long we'll be able to stay in our, our current positions. Just to jump in, because I think you emphasize an important point, the, the sort of hubbub over that one effort at legislation seems to have died down, but I think you, you make an imp uh, important point to keep in mind here, and that is it's not over. They, they will come back to that. There's many ways effort. to skin a cat, yeah. as ugly as that expression is. Um, so, yeah, on the question on. of contracts. Yeah. So throughout the campaign period, and uh, you know, I, I heard this from, the, uh, from, from, uh, from Rocio Nali herself, there was this question of, well, we're going to review the contracts. And Andres Manuel, when he came to the Wilson Center in September of last year, said as much. He said, yes, we're going to review the contracts because we want to make sure that they were legal, that there was no corruption in the process. And I said to him, I said, look, I, I observed the, uh, the bidding process. It was the most transparent thing that's ever happened in Mexico. <laughs> you know, I don't think you're going to find anything funky. They said, oh, you wait and see. Now, if you speak to different people in the Andres Manuel team, then they'll say different things. Andres Manuel says, we want to review these contracts. We want to make sure that they are legal. Sometimes he throws in the word justo as well, just or fair, which is a very worrying word because that's entirely subjective. If you speak to his um, uh, chief advisor, his chief of staff, uh, Alfonso Poncho Romo, Poncho Romo will say, ah, we've already looked at the contracts. They're absolutely fine. They're, they're legal and above board. No problem. When you speak to Rocio Nale, she says, I think there's something funky with those contracts. <laughs> and she says, not necessarily with the big oil companies, but with some of the smaller ones that were backed by private equity. I'm concerned about those. And that question has not been resolved. Yeah. They've had adequate time to review all of those contracts. They're all available for you to, to look at on the Hydrocarbons Commission website anyway, but they're, making, they're dragging it out as much as possible. Now, do I think they're going to revoke contracts? I think it's very, very unlikely that they will because that would cause a huge political and economic fallout. So I think that probably what we're going to see is that they're using this as a form of political leverage to try to 
push the investment investors to speed up their investment in the oil projects. And in fact, in a recent meeting, a private meeting between Andres Manuel and uh, the oil companies that have invested in Mexico, he said as much to them. He said, I'm happy that you're here, I'm happy that you're investing, but I want to see results more quickly. And they said, what do you mean? Do you understand that you know, it takes five years to basically you know, get the first oil out of the ground at the very quickest? He says, no, 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 I want to see you speeding up your investments. I want to see more money flowing. And that's entirely consistent with what he said in Washington in September of last year, when he said, you know, I said that there had been 107 contracts, you know, potentially 180 to 220 billion dollars of investment. He says, yeah, but none of that or very little of that money has flowed so far. I want to see it coming in. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. Maybe the oil companies will speed up their investments. But if I was their financial advisor, I would say probably best not to speed it up until you know exactly what the environment is going to be. What we do know is that uh, after much speculation, there, it looks as though there will be no new oil uh, auctions taking place for two years. That was the, the, the period of time that was uh, floated earlier on. Um, the potential future head of uh, Pemex Exploration and Production, a good friend of ours, Fluvio Ruiz, said that as much in a newspaper at one point. The future energy minister immediately came out and said, he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> he's not in control of this. And then she later on came out and said, yeah, it's going to be two years. So it looks as though there won't be any new auctions. However, there will likely be a bidding process for services contracts with Pemex. And I think that gives us a very good idea about where the administration's focus is. It's not about getting more private money into oil exploration and production. It's about helping Pemex increase its production as much as possible. The big discovery that was announced the other day, uh, onshore discovery in Mexico, is great news for the Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador administration. The outgoing administration says, this is proof that our energy reform has worked. And nobody's going to listen to that at this point in time. Andres Manuel will seize that and say, look, Pemex can do it. If we just let Pemex do what it wants to do, then it can produce more oil. And sure enough, by 2022, we're going to see a lot of that new oil coming out of the ground from Pemex because it's an existing well, sorry, an existing field that was discovered before, but they've just greatly increased the total amount of reserves that are there. And it's going to be possible to pump a lot more oil out of that much more quickly. The question, though, is has he once again perhaps overpromised as many politicians are known to do by guaranteeing a certain level of oil production in the middle of the sexennial, mm -hmm. even though there are some of those indicators you say that there could be a recovery? All right, let, I want to move a little bit to natural gas and electricity and then open it up to folks. Um, but let's pivot from what you just said, because I think what you were talking about, resource nationalism, but Pemex as the national champion. Yeah. So the energy sovereignty question, right? I think everything that when when this this administration and, and, and AMLO himself, the lens that he looks at energy through is the national champions of Pemex. But let's also talk about the other national champion, and that's CFE. Yeah. And I and I want to use that to then talk about the electric sector because, as part of the major 2013 2014 reforms, one of the the, the most dramatic uh, changes was the creation of a, an electricity market in Mexico and the creation of an auction process. We talk a lot about the oil contracts uh, and the auctions that have happened there, but si simultaneously to, to those, there have been three uh, auction processes that have, have led to several contracts in the renewables uh, space and, and huge developments in the electric market in Mexico, right? I mean, major changes, CFE was no longer allowed to be the, the monopoly, as it were. But then we now see the appointment of, of a well-known Mexican politician named Manuel Bartlett to be the director general of CFE. And if we transfer some of that same energy nationalism and look at CFE instead of Pemex, my question to you is, what does that mean for the electric sector? And just as much as we've talked about no new contracts in the oil and gas space, well, there was supposed to be an electric auction in the last few weeks that has been postponed. I don't think there's a lot of clarity what's going to happen with that. Those were the auctions that the government was using to, to further leverage uh, deployment of renewable energy and further generate clean energy uh, a goal or reach their clean energy goals. So what's going to happen there? And the, the, the real question is, will Bartlett be discharged with the responsibility of making CFE great again? And, and, and what I mean by that is, the dominant national champion in the electric space? 
There's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> there, there, there is, and it's very common. But I would urge you, I mean, in this book, it's, um, there's a great, great chapter by Peter Nance on the reform of the electricity sector, which um, goes into an enormous amount of detail. It's, it's well worth taking the time to read it. And then there's a very nice chapter by Lisa Vasidi on renewables uh, as well and looking at how that, uh, that plays out. So um, let's look, first of all, at, uh, at the appointment of Manuel Bartlett as the head of CFE. Um, one thing, just going into a little bit into the organogram uh, of uh, the Energy Ministry in Mexico. Right at this point in time, in the last two days of the Peña Nieto administration, you have a Secretary of Energy and you have three undersecretaries. One for hydrocarbons, one for electricity, one for energy transition. In the new Energy Ministry, there's going to be an Energy Secretary, Rocio Nale, an undersecretary, one undersecretary, who is Alberto Montoya, who's going to be in charge of everything. And then you're going to have... Um, I can't remember the t where the word is. It, it's coordinadores, okay. coordinators of different areas. So one for energy transition, one for hydrocarbons, one for electricity. Right. So you've got that change in the organogram. Manuel Bartlett, as Jeremy said, is a very, very well-known Mexican politician. He's an 82-year-old former priesta, former uh, uh, pete, well, worker party uh, representative, um, most famous, I would say, outside of Mexico for the fact that any time a foreigner would mention the word energy within Mexican nat national territory, he would claim that this was a violation of sovereignty. You as a foreigner do not, do not have the right to talk about oil or gas or electricity here in Mexico, um, would try to invoke Article 33 of the Constitution, which is, you know, expels foreigners from the country, um, and would get generally very, very upset. So when he was, his appointment was announced, I think everyone just sort of said, oh my God, what is going to happen? But there's an interesting phenomenon that's happened, which is that some of the private companies that I've spoken to who have sat down with Manuel Bartlett say that he actually gets it. He gets the importance of working with the private sector. If you're going to be able to deliver electricity to the Mexican public at low cost, then you do actually need to keep working with some of these contracts. Are you going to uh, award new contracts Probably not. So what I think we're going to see is that there is going to be uh, a lot of uh, uh, tenders that are going to be put out there for companies to produce electricity directly for CFE. So instead of it being an entirely open process where you can produce electricity and sell it to any one of the qualified suppliers, I think we will see auctions or tenders put out there so that you can produce electricity to sell to, to CFE. There will be a centralization of... Which uh, is not too dissimilar from the pre, the, the PRE, the prior to 2013 yes. reform, because the one thing I think that's worth noting is there had been a slight opening uh, yes. to private participation yeah. in the electric yeah. sector. Yeah. Um, so, so, so perhaps what we're doing is going a little bit back to more of the independent power producer model where there's a direct contract let by CFE, not a international auction. Exactly. Now, on, on the other, um, another side of this, is that uh, there is discussion that perhaps the old, there, were, there used to be two utilities in Mexico. There was the CFEN, then there was Lucy Fuerza del Centro, which was for the, the sort of the central part of, of Mexico. There's some discussion that maybe Lucy Fuerza will be brought back. But well, they still have the manhole covers in many places they in do. Mexico City. They so do. That, that and the interesting thing is that the union from Lucy Fuerza is now actually the part owner of a generation company in Mexico. They signed, they signed a deal with a Portuguese company and they now own generation capacity in Mexico, which is weird that the old union which opposed the energy reform is actually benefiting from the reform. We'll see how that plays out. But the other thing which is, and this takes us directly to the, the focus on renewables and clean en energy. And under clean en energy, I will, talk, I will include natural gas for the time being, and some of you may have an issue with that, but just let it fly for the time being. Andres Manuel, during his, the election campaign, was very, very clear. He said that, look, we need to produce more electricity through CFE, and the way to do that is to bring back some of the old fuel oil plants that have been converted to natural gas. We should be producing electricity with fuel oil, with combustolio. Incredibly dirty and at times extraordinarily expensive way of producing electricity. Now, Talk about going back to the future. I mean, this is really is a, a, a blast from the past here. Is the DeLorean. Um, recently, he's talked about the need to produce more electricity from coal. Yeah. Even though Mexico doesn't really have a reliable coal source. Um, and when he's talked about Mexico becoming independent in natural gas production, because he's obsessed with that, 
He doesn't like the fact, and his advisors and his representatives will talk about this in public on, uh, on, on regular occasion. He says, we should not be dependent on any other country for our energy, and by any other country he means the United States. Um, he wants to Mexico to become independent in natural gas production, but he recently came out and said, but I will not allow fracking on Mexican territory. So the only way that I see you're going to dramatically increase natural gas production in Mexico in the short term is through fracking. And even then it's complicated. But uh, he believes that you can get associated gas out of the, out of the ground and from under the sea uh, relatively easily. Um, I don't think he fully understands the, uh, the process, and I don't think he fully understands the infrastructure requirements of getting that gas to market. Um, and some of you, just an interesting, if you have five minutes to spare, just do a YouTube search for Andres Manuel and, uh, and, and, and oil. And one of the videos that will come up is him explaining how oil production and gas production works. He says, we don't need any foreign companies. They talk about their great technology. You don't need technology. I'm from Tabasco. I've seen it. You drill a hole in the ground, the oil comes out. It's like it's taken directly from a Bugs Bunny cartoon. It's beautiful. And, uh, you know, it, you watch and you think, wow, does, this is man is from, from Tabasco. Does he really understand how the oil industry actually works? Well, sadly, for a while, maybe it was that easy. Well, yes, certainly. <laughs> I mean, if you look at Cantarell, I guess it was for a while, wasn't it? Excellent. Well, there, there's, a, there's a lot more that I want to keep asking you about, but... We have a, a wonderful group here who I'm sure would, would like to ask some specific questions as well. I've got more, so if you're being shy, I'll keep going. If you want, no, you're not. Very good. Uh, we'll start with Paola, Oscar, and then we'll take it from there. Good morning, Paola. So we were lucky enough to have um, Jesus Seade, NAFTA's chief, uh, sorry, AMLO's chief NAFTA negotiator, with us at the Wilson Center recently. And in addition to being a highly entertaining speaker, um, and I just want to share with you one little anecdote. He was asked a question at one point about uh, had Trump insisted on something in the negotiations. He didn't really understand the question, even when it was re repeated. So he decided to tell a little anecdote about Donald Trump. And it gives you an idea of how funny and entertaining this guy is. He said, I only got the chance to meet with Donald Trump once. And he's an impressive man. I mean, he's a big man. I don't mean big like this. But he's a, he pointed to me. He says, like, like Duncan. I'm like, please don't compare me. And, and then he said, he said so he's, 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 he's tall. He's imposing. He says, and he's... How do I put it? He's cylindrical. Which is a brilliant word that I've never heard anybody described as. But anyway, he says, and he has an impressive mane of hair. It's like, it's like he's from outer space. And I thought, who describes the president of the United States like that? Impressive, cylindrical, and from outer space. I thought it was, it was a beautiful thing. But anyway. Uh, it is. <laughs> it's on there now. Um, anyway, to get back to the, uh, the story. Seade um, explained that when he was appointed chief NAFTA negotiator by Andres Manuel, he was told that he should go along with every single thing that the Peña Nieto team had been doing. He said, agree to everything that they've already negotiated and everything that they're going to negotiate, with one exception, and that's energy. The chapter on energy, as it was originally written, was an affirmation of the energy reform. That language got taken out. And now there's new language in there. And that language says that every state has the constitutional right, has the sovereign right to control its subsoil resources. And with that, Andres Manuel is happy. What he didn't want was any explicit affirmation of the energy reform, which is what the language that was originally in there did. It basically celebrated the energy reform. And Andres Manuel said, I'm not going to allow that to be in there. Take that out, replace it with my language, and we're perfectly fine. Does this undermine the energy reform in any way? No, it doesn't. Because, you know, essentially, um, you know, that celebration of the energy reform wouldn't have prevented Andres Manuel from changing the Constitution anyway. But it was more of a symbolic thing. However, there are elements 
in the USMCA that do tie his hands. And that is that, of course, the treaty, um, and it is going to be a treaty, not just an agreement in, uh, uh, yeah, it'll be signed tomorrow morning. Um, once it's ratified, if it's ratified by the, uh, uh, by the US Congress, um, it will acquire the status of a treaty in Mexico, uh, which means it's almost at the same level as the Constitution, according to Mexican law. Slightly less, but, but pretty strong. And of course, the NAFTA, or the USMCA, allows for the free flow of uh, molecules and electrons across the borders of North America. So if Andrés Manuel does want to prohibit the importation of gasoline, refined products, into Mexico, or to restrict gas, or to restrict ele the electricity trade, then he would run into problems with the USMCA. So I think that's a very important element of that. But Andres Manuel adopted a very pragmatic approach to the USMCA from, from day one, which was that he recognized that NAFTA, NAFTA 2.0, whatever we call it, is an existential issue for Mexico. That if you don't get an agreement on free trade in North America, then Mexico's economy was going to fail, and he didn't want to be the one that was responsible or be, to, to be the one who was impacted by that because he recognized that if he really wants to Im implement his plans for a fourth transformation of Mexico, as he calls it, then he needs to have a relatively stable economy. Jesus Ayala has been now named as the Undersecretary of North American Affairs in the Foreign Ministry, so he will continue to be a, a, an important person. Um, the, the energy chapter is one page, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Literally one page. Less than a page, yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, I think Oscar was next, and then we'll go to David, and then, and then you, sir. And then, yeah, so, Oscar. So on the, on the border renewable energy projects, um, you know, nothing is set in stone. Um, my own prediction is that we get to year three of this administration and things begin to change quite significantly for a number of reasons. I think, I mean, if we see a, an economic slowdown in the United States at the end of next year, early in 2020, then I think, you know, that, that puts a lot of pressure on, on Andres Manuel. If things aren't going well, he'll begin to lash out. I think there's a, and of course in year three, he's gonna hold a, a referendum on his own uh, presidency. And he's promised that if it goes against him, then he'll step down from the presidency. It's not gonna go against him. And of course, I fully predict that there will be an 80% approval rating in that, maybe 86%. Um, and as that, at that point, maybe a senator will come forward and say, he's so popular, maybe we should change the constitution to allow him to run again for office. Um, but in the first three years, and that's all I'm going to limit myself to, I don't think he's going to mess with any of those projects. I think that uh, there will become, there will be regulatory um, obstacles. There will be complications that will emerge. It's going to be more difficult to do business in general in Mexico. But he's not going to want to upset the apple cart for something which, you know, as Jeremy suggested earlier on, he doesn't see as being fundamentally important in terms of energy sovereignty or resource nationalism. I mean, the projects that there are along the border um, of exporting energy to the United States, he'll see as a very interesting form of bringing revenue into the country, of showing that Mexico is a country that can compete. Um, one of his favorite phrases during the campaign and from you know, his, uh, his, the people who surround him was, vamos a producir. And when you ask them, wh what do you want to produce? They said, everything. This is, a, this is almost a Trumpian idea that we should you know, build it here in America. They want to make it here in Mexico for national consumption. But if we happen to export some of it, that's fine as well. And of course, there is that very interesting comparison 
with what he said about oil. He doesn't want to export oil. He came out recently and he said, we want to produce oil for consumption here in Mexico. Why would we want to sell it to foreigners? Which was a really good reason because you make a lot of money out of that. And he said, no, no, what we want to do is we want to leave it in the ground so that future generations can use it. And then you try to get him into the idea of stranded resources and you kind of lose the conversation. Um, but yeah, I think that those projects are going to be fine with the, ex with the exception of a more complicated regulatory environment. On USMCA and the famous uh, section which says that if any of the members begins a free trade negotiation with a non-market economy, basically meaning China, but it could mean Venezuela, it could mean North Korea, it could mean Cuba, but it's China, then that country has to give three months notice to the other members of the agreement before beginning the negotiation. If the other members don't like the fact that it's negotiating a free trade agreement, then they can withdraw from the, from the new NAFTA, from the USMCA, with six months notice. Now that second part is irrelevant. Any member of the new agreement can withdraw with six months notice over any issue they like. They don't in fact have to give an issue. They can just say, we're, we're, we're pulling out. But the explicit language that's used serves two purposes. One is to make sure that Canada and Mexico are focused primarily on the United States, yes. But much more importantly than that is that the United States, or rather the Trump administration, wants to include similar language in every single free trade agreement that it signs from this point on. Japan is painfully aware of this. Uh, the Europeans are painfully aware of this. This is about trying to recapture some of the uh, containment of China that was included in the TPP, which Trump withdrew from. And just a little side comment here. You know, this is great phrase. I mean, uh, Donald Trump came out and said, you know, NAFTA is the worst agreement ever signed. The USMCA is the greatest uh, 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 treaty or agreement ever signed. And then you have to say, yeah, but is it as good as the TPP was? The TPP did all of this and so much more, and we threw it all away. So it's just a little bit of irony there. And I do pray that one day the United States comes back into uh, what has become TPP-11, but uh, we'll have to wait and see. Well, I think it, it, an interesting thing more away from maybe perhaps just a trade agreement space, but if you look at what China's done with the One Belt, One Road initiative, has absolutely brought in almost every month or two you see a new country in Latin America signing up for the One Belt, One Road initiative. Again, not a trade agreement, but certainly uh, uh, a continuation of pulling by China countries in Latin America into their economic sphere more, more effectively. I think David was next, and then the gentleman here, and then we want to get to this side as well. So David, please, and then to, uh, we'll, we'll try and, if we don't get to all, how, how much time you got? I think we got until two o'clock. Okay, not? David. <laughs> okay. It's raining out, you stay uh, here with us. Okay, uh, I wanna pick up on um, something that Duncan said uh, in response to the question that was just asked, but it comes up over and over again, all right? There is this pragmatic side to AMLO, okay? Uh, we know when he was regente, did a good job. Okay, you just mentioned that on uh, the NAFTA negotiations, he didn't want to muck it up because it was going to mess up the economy, right? Well, you know, one can make an argument that Mexico needs a productive energy sector, both domestically and for export purposes, if his whole plans are going to change. So then how does this pragmatic side fit with the disruption side that we're all talking about because of the referendum and everything, all right? I want to offer a couple of of ideas about that, all right? First of all, we are in California. We have a proposition system in California, which is the result of, at the early part of the 20th century, people got very angry at the way in which politics was being run here, weren't paying attention to the people, so we instituted a referendum process. You know, if you think about Mexico, 46% of the people living in poverty after 25 years of NAFTA, after an energy reform, after all of this other stuff, if you think about the violence, if you think about the corruption, this is what AMLO's talking about. If you think about the referendum in three years on AMLO, okay, this isn't about concentrating power in AMLO, it's about creating a different kind of political system in which the people will be able to have some direct impact on their leadership, whether it's AMLO or somebody else. So if we think about it in those terms, right, then suddenly the energy reform 
becomes a lot of question about rhetoric to demonstrate that the reform, in fact, won't benefit the old people. It will benefit the people of Mexico today okay, and future generations. And then the pragmatic side of AMLO kicks in. And yes, we've got the contracts, but you know, we look at them a few, we toss out, but the rest of them are there. Proposition system. After living here 15 years, I can tell you, I still haven't gotten used to the propositions in California. But that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> I think I think it's a it, it's a really it's a really interesting and important perspective that you put forward, David. And uh, one thing I will say about the uh, the proposition system is that it already existed in Mexico. You it was possible to have a referendum once a year on non fiscal issues. So that was already there. What he's proposing, or what the clear pattern is, it's going to happen on a regular basis whenever he wants to have something legitimized by the Mexican people. And that's the problem, is that the, the precedent that was set there by these two uh, consulta publica is that you don't care about rules, you don't care about how many people participate, you just set it up as a piece of political theater. Now, once he's in control of the electoral institutions, maybe he'll be able to do a better job but why not wait until December or January? Why, why, did it, why was there the rush to do it during the summer? Because it was non-binding, because he didn't have to follow the rules. And so, you know, and now the Mexican Congress will pass legislation to make it easier to happen anyway. So I agree that you should consult with the people. I believe, that, I believe in people power as well, but I want it to be according to rules I don't want it to be a level playing field, and I don't see any intention of doing it that way. But Wills, we'll see. Um, the question of whether he's a pragmatist or whether he behaves according to principle, I think um, it's both, isn't it? I mean, he, 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 there are both of those AMLOs that are there. What's certain is that there are certain core principles that he believes in very firmly. Um, and, you know, I think that the, I don't want to say make Mexico great again, but, you know, it is... It, it, this idea of, of nationalism is, is is there. It's clearly defined. I think centralization of power is is a se is, is is a critical element for him because he looks back at the great leaders of Mexican history, whether it was Juarez or or whether it was uh, Cardenas, um, and he sees that they had control, and that's his diagnosis. We lost control somehow. We need to bring it back. On corruption, I'm more skeptical than you. I don't. I, I think he has identified the issue that that plays out really well with the Mexican public, because we all know that the Mexican system is corrupt. Does he want to cure corruption? Well, look at his solution. His solution is, I'm going to be an honest leader, so nobody else will be corrupt. That is not a particularly sophisticated approach. When he was asked, do you believe that there should be an independent prosecutor for corruption cases in Mexico? He said, absolutely not. The solution that has been put forward by Mexican civil society over and over and over again he rejected. He said, I'm going to name the prosecutor because I want that person to be somebody who can do a good job. And that, that's worrying because he will then determine who gets prosecuted. And corruption or anti-corruption efforts will become a political tool. When he's been asked about people like um, you know, the former Secretary of Social Development in Mexico, um, you know, should she be prosecuted for corruption? And we've had, there's plenty of evidence out there, I mean, taped phone calls, et cetera. He said, no, 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 no. She's a scapegoat. That's got nothing to say. It's other people. When he was asked about whether we should uh, go after Peña Nieto or Calderon right. for corruption, he said, no, 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 no. But now he's going to put it to a consulta publica. So well, this is, I mean, you know, I, I think the corruption for the new administration is going to be a political issue. You know, at certain times it's, it makes sense to, to use it. At other times it doesn't. And I would suggest that that's one thing about the refinery several people want to better understand because, as we've seen in other parts of the world, or maybe let's just say Brazil, for example, these kinds of enormous infrastructure projects can open Pandora's box if it hadn't already been opened. So um, I love the pragmatic, uh, the pragmatic resource nationalism, right? How do you, <laughs> you can have your cake and eat it too, sir. I think it's on. Yeah. Quick question. In regards to him being obsessed with power, do you think the Mexican central bank autonomy will be compromised? Uh, uh, we were reassured early on when Andres Manuel announced that his pick uh, to go onto the, uh, the, the Banxico board was going to be Jonathan Heath. 
uh, Jonathan Heath, who's a you know, well-respected economist um, and has made a number of statements really showing that he's independent from influence by AMLO. And when asked if he would, uh, what he would do if uh, he was told to change uh, central bank policy uh, by Anderson Manuel, he said, I would resign before I would do that. So that was very reassuring. And then, uh, a couple of days ago, we heard that Gerardo Esquivel, um, who was slated to be the Under Secretary of Finance, is now going to go on to be a deputy governor at the Bank of Mexico um, to replace Del Cueto, who resigned recently. Um, Gerardo Esquivel is a well-respected economist. He's from Colmex. Um, and a lot of people admire him and respect him. Uh, I do too. I mean, he's been one of the most consistent voices who's provided an, on, uh, an alternative uh, explanation of NAFTA and the fact that it really hasn't benefited everybody. I mean, and that's, a, that's an important perspective. I would say this about Gerardo, though. Gerardo has become a lot more political over the summer um, and, you know, has, has really made a lot of statements where he's shown that he is fully in with Andrus Manuel. And I'm not so sure that that sends the same signal of independence of the central bank as Jonathan Heath did. So we'll see. One of those two men is probably going to be the next governor. And what I think is going to happen is there's going to be a competition between them to get Andrus Manuel's attention and to see who really should be appointed. Um, for now, Andrus Manuel is committed to central bank independence. And to be fair, he always has been. Go back to his election campaign in 2006, election campaign in 2012. If you read the manifesto in there, he says explicitly the central bank needs to be independent. He's also committed to a floating exchange rate. Um, for now, he gets the importance of that. I would say that just as we're seeing with the US president today, where he's criticizing his own pick for central bank governor um, saying, you know, why is he raising interest rates? Why is he trying to crush economic growth? If we get into economic hard times in Mexico, the incentives or rather the temptation for Andres Manuel to say, let's have looser money, they grow significantly. And so that's why I raised the prospect earlier on of, the, of a U.S. recession in late 2019 or early 2020. At that point, I think Andres Manuel's commitment to orthodox economics comes under stress. And that's the point where I think you could see an attempt to influence central bank policy. I think we'd also see that the Secretary of Hacienda, Carlos Azul, would come under pressure to start spending a lot more as well. So for now, we're okay. But uh, you know, one of the things that was said to me on the day after the election, I, you know, I was lucky enough to be down there in Mexico City for the election. I went to the Zocalo that night, it was an amazing thing. The next day I met with, a, uh, with an institutional investor and I said, tell me, what do you think about the economic team? And he said, well, look, for example, I have no concern about Carlos Ozua as finance secretary. I said, oh, that's good. Me too. I think he's pretty good. He says, I'm worried about who comes after him. Hmm. And that's the question, is that, you know, who is next? When certain people within the cabinet feel uncomfortable or are pushed out, who is appointed next? And uh, it's a different calculation. At the beginning of your mandate, when you are in a predominant position, you're riding the, the honeymoon wave, or in the middle of your mandate when things are tougher and you uh, feel as though you're losing control, then who do you appoint? So I want to go to Diane. I know we have a couple questions on this side. So we started um, a few minutes late, so we'll run a few minutes late. Diane? Can we take all three questions? Why don't we do, yeah, well, Diane, um, hey, Francisco, good to see you, man. And then is there someone else? Yes, sir. And how about four? We'll do, we'll do four. Excellent. So here we go. This is the rapid fire round. Okay, you oh, how, I, I guess it's two questions in one. Um, with the bidding going directly to CFE and with price control, so the market gets eliminated. Cool, excellent. My question is very similar about the auction process has primarily been for CFE, but has also been uh, directed towards set of contracts between private companies. Okay. Jack, can you, uh, and then Francisco, if you'll, uh, and then I'll end with my famous uh, yes or no question. Mm, okay. Wrap it all up for everyone. Thank you. 
So oh, maybe three times, two times. But in, a, in any case, for Latin America, you know, it's kind of expensive. Whatever the number is. I'm talking about the mordidas too, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I let's, let's begin. Let's go backwards. I mean, with uh, Francisco's question, you know, what's what's been interesting, I think, is is how the auctions have played out in Mexico on renewable energy. I mean, we've seen record low prices there, and uh, part of that is to do with the competitive nature of the of the bidding process. Part of it is to do with technological advance, and part of it is to do with the scale of the projects. I mean, I don't know if you saw this, but uh, uh, the world record for installation of solar panels was recently broken in Mexico, like the most number of panels installed in one day. And you see what's happening in Sonora, you see what's happening in Coahuila. Um, these are extraordinary projects. Um, I think the, the environment for investment in Mexico over the past four years has really helped to lower those costs as well. And uh, Cener, although they didn't even make a big announcement about this, they now have a single window uh, permitting uh, process available online that you can go into and you get all of your permits. You sim submit one set of documents and get everything. I mean, that to me should have been front page news across Mexico. But I had to sit down in a meeting with the undersecretary for, to find out about it. He was like, did you know about it? I said, no, I had no idea. Um, all of that, unfortunately, I think is going to become a lot more expensive now um, because I see that there is going to be sand thrown into the gears of permitting and regulation. So I, I'm, I'm deeply worried about that. Um, in terms of hydrocarbons production, there's no doubt that Andres Manuel has a preference for using hydrocarbons to produce electricity. Um, as I said earlier on, he'd like to bring back the combustolio, the, the fuel oil. Um, uh, he talks about, about coal um, because you know, his idea is, well, this is, this is the energy that he understands. It's the energy that he grew up with. And, you know, it's energy that provides jobs in Mexico. And it's going to be a heck of a hard sell to tell him that renewable energy produces jobs, you know, in the, in the same way or even better than, than hydrocarbons. I don't think he's going to be very receptive to that. So I'm, I'm not super uh, optimistic about the future for renewables in Mexico. Um, and, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm working with one renewable energy company right now that's trying to do it, and we're, we're hoping that we'll be able to find a receptive ear within the new administration. But many people are telling us that it's going to be very, very complicated. Um, John, your question about the Servicio Basico and uh, Auto Abasto, basically, like those you know, direct supply contracts. Um, I don't think Andres Manuel is opposed to that. I think that uh, he would recognize that, yes, that's fine if, if a company needs to to have access to electricity, to energy that would come from one of these direct supply, self-supply contracts, then it could happen. Um, but you know, the old model of self-supply isn't there anymore. It got eliminated in the constitutional reform. So now you have to go through one of the qualified suppliers, right? And the qualified suppliers, um, I haven't had a chance to sit down with any of them yet, um, with the exception of uh, CFA Calificados. Um, and, but thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, but what I'm worried about again there is is about getting all the permitting done. It's going to be a much it's going to be a tortuous process, I fear, for a number for a couple of reasons. One is that there's not going to be the same receptivity to doing this kind of thing, and the second one is that we are going to see a thinning out of the public service, which means that things are going to slow down anyway. Um, so I think a lot depends on what kind of leadership Manuel Bartlett really does exert. At uh, at CFE, um, you know clearly he's not. He's so one social uh, uh, problem is just the uh, the lack of improvements in the the uh, when the process of uh, of getting one of those permits still took a huge thinning of the public supply. Yeah, uh, and there there are two there are two approaches to this two opinions that I've heard. One is that. It's good that Andrew Manuel is president because he's exactly the kind of leader that could quash any kind of social process if he th thinks it's important. But the other one, which I think is much more likely, is that people feel empowered by Andrew Manuel as president. He's not going to mess with us. He's our president. So we're going to insist. We're going to demand. We're going to protest. We're going to block projects. The Maquilas will do well 
as long as the United States economy continues to do well. And Andrus Manuel has shown through his commitment to the new USMCA that he you know, will be quite happy to see goods being exported from Mexico to the United States. Will he make uh, complaints about uh, wages? Yes. Will he attack some of these companies about uh, their, their working conditions, about labor conditions? Perhaps. But that's probably too fine print for him. Overall, what he wants to see is he wants to see economic growth, he wants to see employment going up, and if the maquilas are part of that, then bienvenido. Duncan, thank you. Let me let me throw one comment in, and, and then we'll uh, we'll wrap up here. And, and it, uh, something I want to offer because I think an interesting thing when we take so much of what we've talked about, and, and this comes specifically to the renewable energy space. And the the one thing I think is if the dialogue and if the conversation in Mexico can proceed with the understanding and using the language of energy sovereignty domestic supplies, Mexican created energy, then I think there is a huge opportunity because there's really an ill-defined space at this point in time, I would suggest, in the policy making, uh, the incoming policy making structure in Mexico to really pick up and, and proceed on renewables. But I think if we take this Mexico first idea, renewable energy in Mexico as a guarantor of, of energy sovereignty could be a, a, an interesting way to continue to look. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I think it could be a space for conversation and dialogue that matches up what may be in the oil sector, uh, 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 you know, disparate positions. Um, so I'm, I'm optimistic that, that renewables will come to a point of being a, 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 uh, an important area for this government going forward. Um, let me plug something. We talked a lot about the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement. Uh, the Institute of the Americas, together with, with the Inter-American Dialogue, is hosting an event on December 11th in Washington, D.C., specifically to talk about what does the new U.S. Congress mean for Latin America, and one of the principal themes of, dis of discussion that morning will be the USMCA um, and what that means for energy, and obviously, what does the new U.S. Congress perhaps think of the USMCA, because as Duncan mentioned, although it, the agreement's signed tomorrow, it still has to go through the approval of the Congress, uh, of all Congresses, actually, not just the U.S. So, all right. We're, we're almost done, but I always have to finish with the yes or no question. Anyone who's ever been to, and you've been to plenty, so you know it's coming. The yes or no question that will we'll put the bow and wrap all of this up for us. We heard a lot about Alfonso Romo during the transition. We heard a lot about Alfonso Romo during the campaign. A lot of people, I would suggest, a lot of people sort of the business side, the investor class, the investment community, we're very hopeful that Alfonso Romo, who is a well-known businessman from Monterey, was their conduit and was somebody who they could always have an ear uh, in the incoming administration. My yes or no question is, did Alfonso Romo, the incoming chief of staff to Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, lose his credibility as that conduit for investors because of the, national, the, the new international airport decision? Yes or no? <laughs> This is being webcast, right? You want me to turn off the camera? This is great, yeah. <laughs> uh, no. No, he didn't. Um, there's no doubt that he lost some credibility, but he hasn't lost all credibility. And part of that is that you know, everybody who's had the chance to meet with Poncho Romo recognizes this is a guy who gets it. Yeah. And he's the best hope that you have within the cabinet or within the, the inner circle of Andres Manuel to get that point across. And he has had partial success. But you know, that's one of the things about Andres Manuel. Uh, and my colleague, Carlos Heredia, said this beautifully recently. He said, look, nobody says no to Andres Manuel. There, were, there used to be one person who would be able to say, estás tonto, Andres Manuel. And that was his late wife. And when she died, that, la that last person who could tell him that he was being stupid, that he was exaggerating, that he was going too far, that person no longer is, is there. And so whilst you can try to influence Andres Manuel, you can put arguments on the table, he doesn't necessarily listen to you. And if he's committed to something, if he has an idea in his head, he's going with it. And there's very little you can do to dissuade him. So, so I think that he's the, uh, Poncho Romo is the best hope. And what most of us, I think, are worried about is how long does he last in that position? He's a very successful businessman. He has lots of money. He doesn't need to be there. He's committed to it right now because it's part of the project and he wants to play a constructive role. But if it becomes ugly for him, yeah. I think he leaves. So can I just say one other thing before we go? And there was something that David said earlier on, I think, 
about the you know the energy sister, the energy reform being good for Andres Manuel, the energy sector in its current state. I agree with you 100%. In fact, I made this point yesterday at our, at our event in Mexico City. If Andres Manuel was able to look at the energy reform if from a different angle, he'd see that this is actually the best thing that ever happened to him. You know, in terms of money, in terms of energy production, that this would be a, a, ideal. But it, that's not what, the, what it's about. It's about principle for him on this, I think. And yes, there's an element of pragmatism. But, you know, he is, he's decided that the energy reform is, is not a good thing. And so whilst he's not going to unmake it, he's not going to promote it either. Well, he's so never been for it. He's never been for it, no. Duncan Wood. Thank you. Man. Thank you very much.